Good morning, everybody. We're super excited to have you at this program this morning. This is our September installment of the ABOR Speaker Series, and it's focused on rental issues in a COVID-19 world. Um, COVID has impacted everything in our lives, but it's definitely had a profound impact on the lives of those that are engaged in rentals on the tenant side and on the landlord side. Some of the most direct impact that our housing market has felt with regards to COVID and the pandemic overall directly correlates to the rental housing specifically. Many residents are struggling to pay housing costs. Landlords are concerned about how to cover costs while only collecting partial rent payments, if that. And local officials are trying to provide relief on all sides. Their back is against the corner in some ways. And everybody wants to know how long will this last and what will our rental market look like when the pandemic is over? We've got an awesome panel of experts today. All of these folks are people that I've worked with personally in different interactions across the city. And I know that they are the right experts to bring these these issues to light for you, help you navigate what's happening in your own business, and think about the, the future of our rental market across Central Texas. So before I turn it over to Jenny uh, to introduce the panel, I want to thank you guys again for joining us. I want to let you know that ABOR will absolutely continue to be here for all of our members as we work through this pandemic crisis together. Uh, don't forget that we want to serve you in the best way that we know how, which is all the ways that you want it. So be sure to keep giving us feedback on how we can continue to serve you um, through this changing environment. Thanks so, so much, guys, for being here. Jenny, I'm going to turn it back to you. Thanks, Emily. Um, so much. Before we dive into the ins and outs and our discussion, I want to introduce our panelists, but I also want to make sure that all of you out there know that this is an opportunity for you to ask questions. We may not be able to get to all of your questions today, but pop your questions in the chat box down there at the bottom, um, and our team will, will gather them. We'll get to as many as possible. Um, throughout the program and those that we aren't, aren't able to get to, we will provide some follow-up as well. Um, so let's introduce our, the members of our panel. First, we have Michael Francis. Michael Francis is a broker and instructor and has been managing residential property in the greater Austin area since 1985. He's been directly involved in the daily operations of Rollingwood Management since its inception in 1986. As a Texas Realtors instructor, he is passionate about helping fellow Realtors up their leasing game and property management game. Michael's a former mayor and city council member of City of Sunset Valley, south of Austin, and is currently an active member with ABOR and has served on many committees. I've had the pleasure of working directly with him on several committees as well. Thank you. Um, Next, we welcome Mandy DeMaio. Mandy is the Community Development Administrator for the City of Austin and has had more than 20 years of experience in the areas of affordable housing and community development. She's responsible for managing housing and community development programs funded through local, state, and federal resources. Additionally, Mandy is responsible for developing and fostering strategic relationships with the community to further the mission of the city's Neighborhood Housing and Community Development Department, which is soon to change names <laughs> and to be much shorter. Um, prior to working with the City of Austin, Mandy served as the Executive Director of Housing Works, a nonprofit research, education, and advocacy organization that's dedicated to increasing affordable housing in Austin. And finally, our last panelist today is Aves Azar, and he's the Community and Regional Planning PhD student at UT um, in the School of Architecture. Over the past seven years, Aves has been involved in affordable housing and social justice advocacy in Austin. So he brings a great different perspective for us and our members. Um, he currently serves on the City of Austin Planning Commission, the Executive Committee of the Housing, Austin Housing Coalition, the Board of Housing Works, and as the Chair of the Organization's um, Ad Advocacy Committee, the Membership Council of Austin Con Austin's Continuum of Care, and the Steering Committee of planning our communities. You are so busy, Aves. Wow. Um, previously, Aves worked as the program manager for the Austin Community Investment Collaborative at Housing Works. Um, and his focus there was on affordable housing policy. And then later in the program, we will um, be joined by NAR Director of Federal Housing and Commercial Policy, Megan Booth, who will provide an update on the um, recent CDC order, NAR's activities on that um, 
on that order and then um, current legislation at the federal level. So let's just dive right in. Um, this question is for all of you. Um, from your relevant perspective as a property manager, housing advocate, or local official, what's the most challenging um, issue facing our rental market during this ongoing pandemic? Uh, Michael, we'll start with you. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, great to be here with all these uh, professionals and great folks, great material, uh, perfect timing. Uh, it's been enough, a little bit of time for things to kind of settle into what the new norm is and, and for us to establish those processes. You know, the biggest challenge is just almost a three-prong approach. It's the challenges that face the tenants and the residents in the properties, the challenges that face us as property managers and then servicing the needs of our clients, and then accommodating for the whole COVID issue in terms of servicing properties and making maintenance requests. So those three things bundled into a package have really been a challenge for us as a property management industry. Awesome. Uh, Mandy, from your perspective, what's been the most challenging issue? I think the most challenging issue has been the unknown. It's the unknown related to COVID. Uh, you mentioned in the introduction, uh, you know, when is this going to end? Of course, nobody has the answer to that. Um, but from a tenant perspective, keeping a family or a household stable in their home, um, keeping a job in order to pay rent, utilities, other um, necessary daily needs, um, I think all of the unknown is very destabilizing. And so the biggest challenge to me is keeping tenants stable in a very destabilized environment. That uh, makes perfect sense. Aves, what are you seeing from your side? Yeah, thank you all. You know, this is a really exciting conversation. I'm glad we're having this. I wish we could have it under better circumstances, but it's still a very mm -hmm. conversation. And I think you know, just building on what Maggie is saying, stabilizing tenants really is an issue right now. What we're seeing is tenants are struggling. Mm -hmm. They're struggling in a big way. So folks are struggling with paying rent, but then also meeting the other needs around it. So we're looking at people trying to keep a job while their children are trying to get education within their home, figuring out child mm -hmm. it's, it's a network of issues and support that folks need at this time, and they're struggling to get that. And I think the only other thing I want to mention is what we're seeing is that folks are continuing to, you know, gain employment and work and pay their rent somehow. But I'm not sure how sustainable this can be in the long run. People are impacting their health. And if we're, if you're continuing to work because you're paying rent, but somehow your health gets impacted by COVID because of going out of the house, well, then that puts a stop to all of that and makes it very unsustainable in the long term. So I think that's for me is one of the key challenges right now. I think exactly to what Mandy was saying. How do we, how do we see this going forward, knowing that we do not see an end in sight at the moment, or at least there's no certainty on when this will end, and just managing and making sure that tenants receive the support that they need during this time. Yeah. So, Jenny, just a quick follow up to what Abbas yeah. said, and we're very much aware that, you know, at some point there'll be a day of reckoning, right? We can keep kind of going down, but and as he said, talking now about what that's going to look like and, and starting to prepare for that for success and, and, and gearing up for success for everybody that's possible, it's, it's critical that we continue to have those conversations. Yeah, yeah and I, I did also want to add that this gets to the, the unknown that we're all trying to get comfortable in. We don't know when that day of reckoning is going to occur. Right. Um, when COVID first hit and we had, um, you know, the, the mayor and the governor's emergency orders, um, we originally thought, well, this will be a month, it'll be two months, it'll be six months. Um, nobody knows when it's going to end. And we're, there are a variety of uh, initiatives, I know we're going to get into that, um, related to rental relief and um, just emergency support. Um, business support, uh, and there's just a whole patchwork of local, state, federal initiatives, um, and sometimes those are really hard to navigate, um, and, and so it's just a, a lot of that um, unknown. Mandy, you um, segued right into our next question. Perfectly. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so much unknown out there, and, and part of that unknown is navigating those um, 
uh, resources as well as regulations. So we've had local eviction moratoriums, a federal eviction moratorium, health and safety standards, um, and other COVID-19 regulations. Um, so Michael, what has been the best way you've seen for landlords and property managers um, to stay updated on those? And then how have these changing regulations impacted your business and the business of your peers? Okay, well, that's a, that's a long one. <clears throat> we like one-stop shops, and, and for one stop, it's not there. I mean, you have to be on your game as a, as a property owner, as a property manager, and, and checking in with all the different entities. You know, the Austin Board of Realtors has been helpful, uh, City of Austin, uh, Texas Real Estate uh, Association, and going to those places proactively and keeping up with that. In addition to that, finding out what resources are out there, because that's changing. It's available today, it's not available tomorrow, and then trying to get that information out to our residents in a timely fashion has really been a challenge to know all the different entities that are doing things, right? Because there's no, no central hub for that. Uh, and it just requires that we constantly go out there and, and keep on top of that. And then posting that. So we put a, a, a page on our website and we keep sending that link out to the tenants and the owners <clears throat> instead of bombarding them with email because we're all drowning in email. And we just try to keep that posted information up there for them to go as a resource. The challenges for our industry, as I mentioned earlier, and, and I think as Mandy pointed out, it's the unknowns and also how that changes pretty frequently. Uh, you know, it was the CARES Act and then it was the Texas Supreme Court and then Travis County and then City of Austin. Now it's the CDC and whoa, you know, trying to keep all and interpreting all those documents and those guidelines and doing it properly and dealing with the courts. We want to do it properly. Some of those things seem subjective. And so we're trying to interpret that information and be a good resource for the owners and tenants. And that's been a real challenge. In addition to, like the rest of us, taking our operations home, right, real quickly, uh, providing services, as I mentioned earlier, to tenants and, that need maintenance. And okay, is there any, are there children under 18 there? How do we get into the property? Are, are we all COVID and just roll all that together? And it really has been a challenge. I, I have definitely, I've seen some of that firsthand. My uh, landlord has shifted to accepting only online payments, which, you know, have brought her into the 21st century. <laughs> so that's exciting. But I'm sure I know that it was probably a challenge for her to move to that um, after accepting um, only check payments for such a long time. You know, real quick, the contactless thing is we've been able to accommodate that, right? And, and mm -hmm. put that in and, and, but it really separates us, Yeah. right? We used to like to interacted with each other and we visited mm -hmm. and now we're getting pulled further apart. And I, and I find that that's adding more difficulty, the relationship that we have with our residents, uh, because we're not as engaged with them as we are. And we intentionally need to be pulled apart right, temporarily, but that's, I feel that distance and it's really not good for relationships. Definitely. Um, yeah, I, I used to just walk on down to my landlord's house, wave hello, give her, you know, our rental payment. And now we're not able to do that um, because of, of everything that's going on. So that's such a good point. Um, Aves, what are you seeing from the housing advocates perspective? How um, are, is your community of um, community minded folks keeping up with the regulation and making sure that tenants from across the spectrum are aware of what's going on? So oh, I, I think I would agree with what Michael is saying, and I'm sure other folks are going to say the same. It's really hard to keep up with the information. There's a lot going on, and folks are trying to keep up with information in a time that's already very difficult. We're bombarded with so many different information regarding like health standards and how to go to the grocery store and how to figure out your child's school and just how to manage all of that in the middle of it. You're trying to figure out these regulations around your housing access and housing stability. So I think that's definitely a challenge. I would say from the advocate's perspective, we're definitely, I think, keeping up with three places. I think, or everybody should look at those three places among other things. One, the city's done a good job of updating their pages and making sure that there is available there to understand what are the city's regulations and what the county is saying, what the state is saying. I also want to say BASTA locally, so if folks do not know, but it's Building and Strengthening Tenant Action. So they're a tenant advocacy organization. They've been good in putting out information for tenants themselves and understanding from a tenant's perspective. So what I found really useful is they really go through information in a much more accessible and easy way. So it's good to explain to folks if you're struggling to explain it in better ways. 
because it is all very difficult and convoluted, as Michael was saying. And then the National Low Income Housing Coalition has been doing a good job of updating on federal things as they've been coming out. And those things have been moving along pretty fast. So that's been helpful. I think the other piece of it really is how do we make sure the folks understand, to Michael's point, right? Like landlords are trying to understand how do we implement this? How do we do this? And at the same time, tenants are struggling to understand what applies to me, what doesn't apply to me. How do we do this? Do I fall under this category or not? And I think, you know, helping people figure that out will be very, very crucial. And I know we'll talk about the, you know, the national moratorium, but the national moratorium itself has, the eviction moratorium has certain eligibility requirements that you have to meet. It's not, it's not a blanket, nobody gets evicted. It's, you don't get evicted if you meet a certain criteria. And I think just helping folks understand that and what steps they have to make, it's, it's a challenge. It's a really big challenge. Um, I, I'll be honest, I, I, I would love for landlords to work with their tenants and explain to them where they are, what applies to them or does not apply to them and how to work with them. And we're seeing that with some landlords who are working very closely with their tenants and figuring things out. And I think that's really beneficial to both parties in a strong way when they are able to work together on this. And we're seeing some great success, honestly, you know, in our city, but also across the nation. Um, but then we're also seeing some really, you know, challenging situations, not so much in our city, but in other cities where people are being evicted while they're actually COVID positive. And that's definitely something we should avoid at all costs, but we're not doing that here in Austin. Yeah, um, co creating that communication um, between the um, housing provider and then the resident is key. Um, and it has to be a two-way street. Um, I know that at the very, very beginning of all of this, I sat on my couch before I had a desk at my house talking to Michael on the phone about how to put out information um, to our, our members who manage property or, or operate in the leasing space about the best way to communicate with their um, their residents and, and how to keep that line of communication going. Um, and so this you know has just added additional challenges as time has gone on. So uh, Mandy, as far as communication, how is the city communicating all of these different regulations to landlords, property managers, and tenants? What's, how, how are y'all trying to tackle that huge challenge? It is a huge challenge. And um, I will say, Aves, thank you for the shout out that the city is doing a, a pretty, I think you said pretty good job. Um, we do try to keep <clears throat> as updated of information as possible on various websites through the city. Um, AustinTexas.gov slash housing is our department's neighborhood housing and community development website. And on there, we have resources for both renters and homeowners um, in these COVID times um, and try to keep the information as current as possible. Um, one thing that was mentioned early on was embedded in the CARES Act. So this was the first time we saw this kind of eviction moratorium um, federally, uh, but it was very specific to how your home, multifamily or single family was financed. Um, and I think it was a really uh, high bar and high expectation to think that either a homeowner um, or a renter would have access to the information and understand how their home was financed and whether or not these rules actually applied to them. Um, so we did work closely with the National Low Income Housing Coalition that did create kind of cold all of the data. Um, again, it wasn't perfect data, but at least to provide some basic information to folks to help them understand whether or not these rules in fact applied to them. Um, we, of course, resulted in multiple um, uh, eviction moratorium, which sometimes had some conflicting language. There was a lot of confusion. We have relied on some of our local partners like BASTA, which Aves also mentioned, um, to provide some uh, legal context to um, how and when certain uh, rules and requirements um, apply. Our departments across the city are tackling um, COVID-19 in different ways. Our code department um, has been proactive in terms of uh, communicating with landlords um, regarding requirements under uh, the emergency order. Uh, our economic development department has been very proactive uh, with respect to um, taking the, the CARES funding based on our city council direction 
and creating programs to deploy those funds based on count city council's priorities. So our economic development department has a variety of programs for small businesses, nonprofits, um, uh, the creative community, uh, just a, a whole slew. Our Austin Public Health Department um, has been involved um, extensively with communicating directly with our low-income community, creating a very flexible fund called RISE, um, which the funding is currently, they have $10 million in local funds that's currently available and applicants are eligible. It will be a lottery-based format. The application is currently open. It opened September 14th and I believe it closes on the 21st. Um, and there's an online application and um, eligible folks, households will be um, uh, provided uh, $2,000 in unrestricted funding, which could be used for rent, um, could be used for other needs. Um, obviously, households have a variety. Rent typically is the biggest, um, uh, the biggest payment each month or the biggest responsibility each month. But of course, there are health care um, needs. There are food, basic needs, childcare, you name it. We know that those um, that households need those resources. So that's one fund. And then uh, we worked closely um, with our partners, um, the Housing Authority of the City of Austin. We launched an emergency rental assistance program uh, in May. Initially, we had about $1.4 million in local funds. Um, and we knew we wanted to get something out there pretty quickly. Um, we were able to serve 1,681 households, low-income households through that, providing direct assistance to, um, on behalf of the tenants to the landlord, so paying one month rent. Um, we have since, based on uh, community feedback and council direction, um, reassessed um, the program and launched a new program, still called RENT. We internally call it RENT 2.0. Um, but we have uh, about $12.9 million for direct rental assistance that we'll be deploying over the next week. We had our first payment to landlords uh, last Friday. Um, and it's an online application. Uh, you can access it at austintexas.gov slash RENT, R-E-N-T. Uh, very detailed, frequently asked questions, and then a big orange button to apply. Thank you, Taylor, for posting that in the chat. Um, and uh, it is an ongoing application. We do periodic uh, random sorts, so it's not technically a lottery, but then we have uh, 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 a whole team of eligibility specialists who are going through the documentation to ensure that folks are eligible. We will be paying through these funds, which are both federal and local, um, we will be paying up to three months of the full contract rent amount. Um, so those of you who are landlords out there, please encourage your tenants to apply. Um, it's uh, anybody living within the city of Austin who has a legal rent rental agreement um, and is up to 80% median family income um, is eligible and we will pay back rent or forward rent. Um, depending on your personal situation. So I encourage you, and I'm happy that I can talk forever about the rent program, but I'll pass it back to you, Jenny. Awesome. Yeah, I was, I was looking forward to when you were going to mention the rent program, Mandy, and definitely all of you tuning in, um, please share that resource with your, um, with your residents um, or those, you know, maybe uh, friends, family, or peers who live in the city of Austin that are tenants, um, because that, that is a very helpful resource that, um, you know, of course, it's not unlimited, but it's obviously a much larger pot than it has been before. So that's really exciting. So, you know, we all, everyone touched on eviction moratoriums. Um, so, Michael, we'll pass this to you. Um, so how have the, um, the federal and local eviction moratoriums, of course, like I, you operate in greater Austin, so I'm sure outside of Travis County as well. Um, so there's, you know, differing orders in different places. So how have those uh, moratoriums impacted landlords and that tenant landlord relationship? You know, some of that, another great question. We've already talked to the misalignment with a lot of that and then trying to interpret that. And here's how that started out. Tenants would call and say, I understand I don't have to pay the rent anymore. And so that was kind of the message of what that we that, that was put out, what was heard, right? Based on that wasn't obviously the message. Um, 
that went out, but that's what was heard. And so backing up from there in those conversations was a challenge uh, in the beginning. Yes, but uh, here's the, where do you live? What county are you in? Are you in the city of Austin? Are you Kyle, Buda? Because everybody had different rules and they were changing. Uh, and then the, what was true one day was not true the next day. Uh, we even see that now with the CDC guidelines, trying to figure those out. So under the guise of a relationship, it added some stress to that, right? What do you mean I have to pay the rent? So we have to back up and have a conversation about contracts. And well, I can't, well, oh, here's some resources and then trying to line them up with the agencies that could provide those resources uh, was truly a, a, a bit of a challenge in the very beginning, but as we've done this more, people are becoming more acclimated to it. Oh, okay. And then they're following through more. So that was, that, that was the kickoff of that it was really tough conversations in the very beginning. Yeah, um, I'm glad to see that people are getting more acclimated, but it is still obviously an ongoing challenge with the changing landscape on, you know, what seems like sometimes a daily basis. Yes. Um, so, Aves, from your perspective, how have the moratoriums impacted tenants? Um, is there a, a greater feeling of safety or um, is there still some instability feeling there? What's, what's, what are you seeing? Oh, you're muted. Thank you for that reminder, Jenny. But I was going to say, I feel like there is, um, you know, still a, quite a bit of instability, even with the eviction moratoriums. I think, you know, let's be very honest, these are a stopgap solution. They're a stopgap solution for tenants, but also for landlords. This is not sustainable. We cannot just, this is essentially kicking the can down the road, and we're doing it till the end of this year, it seems like. But folks are going to need assistance so that they can actually pay their landlords. So the landlords can meet their own, you know, mortgage and other, you know, they have duties as well and things that they need to accomplish and tenants need to be able to pay rent. We cannot simply just rely on eviction moratorium. So I think for me, this is definitely just one step and understanding that at the end of the day, the eviction moratoriums are a, they're a health and safety related regulation. They just essentially keep you in your home in a time when we're talking about social distancing, but these are not going to be long-term solutions. And I think just building on something that Michael said, right, like letting tenants know that it's not as simple as, oh, you don't have to be rent now, but understanding, are you eligible? Are you not? Have you been impacted economically by COVID and proving that? And what does that look like in terms of proving that? Because we don't want folks who just feel like they cannot pay rent and then get evicted. So I know that a lot of housing advocates and tenant advocates are really trying to get folks educated on that and saying, no, this does not mean that you simply stop paying your rent, but no, this is about paying your rent and understanding that if you're facing difficulties, having that conversation, trying to access resources. So it's, it's complicated for sure. And I think keeping up with the changing requirements of the various different moratoriums has also been challenging. Yeah. Um, so as as the moratorium, as the requirements, the eviction moratoriums have changed and ebbed and flowed, has that impacted Mandy any of the programs that NHCD is running? Um, what I mean, I'm sure it yeah. has. So how can you describe that for us? Well, so it's been interesting, and we talked about this a little bit yesterday, uh, Michael Aves and I. Um, the uh, one, the eviction moratorium, whether you're looking at the local or the new CDC guidelines, has provided kind of a, a baseline of stability for tenants with a whole lot of confusion uh, tacked on. Um, and we always try to lead with rent is still due, right? This is, you still need to pay your rent and we have some resources to help pay rent. Um, we are, interestingly, when we launched our Rent 2.0 program, um, in our Rent 1.0 program uh, back in May, we had a, about a 72-hour window. So there was this real sense of urgency where we opened online applications. And we got about 5,500 applications within those 72 hours. Um, and... Uh, we were only able to serve 1,681 folks, right? We just didn't have the money to serve uh, everyone who had applied and nor was everyone eligible when we did the eligibility. Um, when we did Rent 2.0 and we opened our application, we decided for a variety of reasons 
um, that we're going to have an ongoing application process. There wasn't going to be a deadline per se. Um, we were going to let the community know we had $12.9 million. Um, and don't rush. We didn't want to add extra pressure on our low income tenants. Don't rush. Um, but we're here when you're ready to submit the application. Um, I will tell you we're about a month into the program and thus far I looked at our numbers this morning. Um, we've had about 4,400 applications over that month. It is the demand or the perceived demand is lower than we had anticipated. Um, part of that is, uh, I, I, I think, related to the fact that we didn't have a small window and create the sense of urgency where we told people you have to apply um, or you're not gonna be eligible. Um, so we've been much more accommodating. Part of it, we think, and a lot of this is anecdotal, up until now, um, there have been federal resources. There has been both unemployment and then the um, federal stimulus check and then the ongoing $600 a week um, bump um, it for unemployment. And so we've, we've seen some dollars going into the community, including the low income community. And it feels like to a large extent, they're, they're paying the rent with that, with that funding. Um, another thing we found is we anticipated, again, we're, we have an ongoing process where we're reviewing applications and then paying money as we go. So um, every week we'll be cutting checks to landlords based on eligible applicants. And we had originally thought that a lot of the folks who would come to us once they applied in August would have a bunch of back rent due. And we were willing and able to pay up to three months of back rent. Um, we didn't find that. And that was kind of interesting to us. Um, so we're learning more as the program goes along. It's helping to inform our outreach strategy, who's applying, who's not applying, how can we reach the folks who are not applying, how can we provide information where there is no information. Um, but it's also leading me to believe that this is a, like we're in this for the long haul. As Michael mentioned, the day of reckoning is coming. And Avest said this too, you know, whether the CDC eviction moratorium runs out in January of 2021, um, the day of reckoning is coming. We don't know when it is going to be or really what it's going to look like, but we know that as a city, we need to be positioned to have the resources to help particularly those low income renters um, who are going to need an enormous amount of help in order to stay in their homes. So we are stretching out our dollars. Um, as long as we can. And we just uh, received our, um, just got the news yesterday that uh, we received a second tranche of uh, CDBGCV dollars, which is from HUD. It's Community Development Block Grant Coronavirus Relief Funding for $7.2 million. And one of the eligible uses and something they're encouraging is emergency rental assistance. Um, there's not a timeline associated with it. So it's something we may want to kind of store in our back pocket um, for deployment in 2021, because I don't want to be in a position as a city where we have expended all of our funds and the day of reckoning comes and we don't have the resources in order to address it appropriately. That is great news about that grant. Uh, Michael, what's going to mention something? And you just real quick, you mentioned relationships and I, I want to, one of the things that's been very refreshing is uh, our clients, whether they're one or two properties or investment groups, 99.9% .9 of our clients have said, do what you need to do to help the client, help the residents stay in their homes. Now, you know, there's mortgage payments to be made and those groups are working with their mortgage companies to defer some of that, but it's not, they're not, mortgage company isn't waving that away. They're just rolling that back to the back end. And so, that, can, that gap is going to continue to, to, to narrow where mortgage companies are going to go, well, you know, we've got to get a payment. What does that look like? Uh, so the encouraging thing was how everyone's chipped in, at least our experience in talking to some of my colleagues as well. Uh, owners and lenders have really understand the complexities of what's going on and doing what they can to help folks stay in their homes. Yeah, you know, a good thing about this whole pandemic is we are all experiencing it. And so I think we're all being a little more understanding and trying to work together um, versus previous um, financial crisis 
where you know only a portion is experiencing part of the situation. Um, although that still is a little bit of the case with terms of finances. Um, Mandy, I love that the the rent 2.0 has been expanded to kind of address as people's needs change. You know, so people mm -hmm. may have had a situation where they were fine and you know what, they've run out of their savings or they no longer Correct. are able to access um, unemployment or anything like that. So it's great that the, that y'all have expanded the um, application period and all of that stuff. So how, how long is that going to be open for just until it runs out or what do you expect? So, yeah, the current uh, program, the rent program, we have funding um, that should go through January of 2021. 20, uh, Our goal is to expend approximately between two and $2.5 million in direct rental assistance each month. Okay. Um, again, as I mentioned, we have right now nearly 4,500 applicants in the pipeline. Um, we are periodically sorting them kind of on a lottery basis, pulling batches of them to go over to our eligibility specialists to confirm all their documentation, reach out to their landlords, um, and then provided we have all the appropriate documentation, we're cutting the checks on a weekly basis. But right now, based on existing funding, we are scheduled to go through January 2021. I would anticipate if we didn't get another dime um, that our application portal will, will be open through the end of the year. Yeah. Um, but as I mentioned, we've already, uh, we just received or received notice um, of seven, an additional $7.2 million. We haven't programmed those dollars yet, um, mm -hmm. but there is a lot of interest um, on the part of our city council on um, deploying those dollars um, for emergency rental assistance. And what we know from the federal parameters, uh, it is it is for very specific purposes, one of which is emergency rental assistance, um, and it's all for low and moderate income households. That's great news. Um, so Michael, shifting gears a little bit, um, we talked about, you know, uh, property owners have to still meet their obligations. A vest touched on that. You did as well. Um, so how are landlords um, and property managers and working with your um, property owner clients um, maintaining maintenance, capital improvements, mortgage and property taxes if, if they're unable to collect full or any, any rent? So what's, what's kind of the give and take with, with what you're seeing? You know, again, the complexities of the issues. Um, <clears throat> If, if residents aren't, of course, we're obligated to maintain property code, right? So habitability is the, we, we continue to take care of the properties that are in there. If a tenant isn't making their payments and their air conditioner goes down, we have no choice but to go in and do the repairs, as we should. And again, owners have been pretty good about us doing cash calls, right? And they're making their mortgage payments and sending us money to keep the properties maintained. Not a whole lot of capital improvements going on at this point. <laughs> You know, we're just keeping the properties up and running. And in talking to some of my colleagues, the same thing. Again, owners have been pretty cooperative. We're doing it. And I understand there's some that aren't, but uh, property code does require that we meet the standards of the contracts that are in there. And that's one of the baselines that we were held to. And so, so we're having to do that and keep those in place. And again, the tenants have been very good about understanding and some and giving us the time to get things done that we need to. But it has been a challenge, right, to call up a landlord and go, guess what, I need to uh, uh, X amount of dollars that you haven't got rent for in uh, four or five months and you need to send me blank dollars to put in a new air conditioning system and not always a pleasant conversation, but they're, they're following through. That's, that's great to hear. I mean, it wouldn't be a job if it wasn't work, right? So, I mean, that's, I guess, just part of it. Um, so uh, Mandy, um, oh, we already touched on that. What types of resources are available through the city that landlords can share? Is there anything that you haven't mentioned that, that our folks should know about that they need to share with their residents? So um, I did want to touch on um, the Economic Development Department. We talked about uh, rental assistance, which is paid directly to landlords, to be clear, um, but it's on behalf of a tenant. So the tenant applies. Um, we have discussed with uh, our, our friends at ABOR as well as the Austin Apartment Association about those situations in which uh, a tenant is either non-responsive, non-communicative, not paying, what will happen with those small landlords. And we wanted to make sure that those needs are addressed and we believe that they can be addressed 
through um, economic development department, uh, their small business grants that they're providing. So I do encourage folks to look at the city of Austin's economic development department, which is providing a whole suite um, of recovery programs um, because that should be where uh, a landlord as a small business squarely lands. However, with respect to uh, your tenants and, you know, Michael talked about that need for constant communication. Um, when you do have the tenant who says, I, I can't, I lost my job, you know, unemployment has run out. I'm, I'm not sure what to do or my hours were cut or whatever. I have been financially impacted by COVID-19. Um, that's where our rental assistance program comes in. And I encourage you all, we have tried to make the, the, the process as simple as possible, um, but it is an online application which the tenant will complete their portion. Um, and then when it goes to the eligibility specialist, the eligibility specialist will reach out to the landlord to gather W-9 um, and a very simple certification and direct deposit information. Um, we've tried to minimize any sort of requirements on the landlord's part. Again, as I said, we're paying full contract rent um, up to three months. If uh, somebody is, if a tenant is 30% and below median family income today. Um, so we check the tenant's income pre-COVID and post-COVID um, in order to ensure that they were financially impacted by COVID-19. Uh, and right now we're finding about three quarters of our applicants are actually falling into that 30% and below median family income. Um, we have, we've looked at the occupations um, of the applicants and, uh, you know, we're, we're hitting a large segment of the uh, service sector, which is great. Um, folks in home health, which is great. Uh, the creative community. Um, those seem to be kind of like they rise to the top in terms of the occupations we're hitting. We are doing extensive outreach, which really started the beginning of this month, but extensive outreach, particularly to um, vulnerable communities, whether it's communities of color, um, uh, folks with limited English proficiency, our application and our eligibility specialists. We have all the information in eight different languages, the top eight languages um, spoken in the city of Austin. Um, and so we are trying to, um, as best we can, reach those hard to serve communities um, and make sure uh, they know that uh, we welcome their application and we hope that we're going to be able to serve them through this program. Jenny, just one more quick thing, and it needs right. to be said. I, I, I want you to know that there is a percentage of the population that's taken advantage of this. And, and there are some property managers out there that have had tenants that are not communicating with them and have not paid their rent or five or six months and they're just sitting on it. And you know they're taking advantage of the situation. Courts are closed, you can't file it. It's just non-payment of rent and there's nothing we can do at this point. And so some of those owners, you know, they're, they're really getting bit hard. <clears throat> Understand there's always a percentage and that, that's the way, but it needs to be known and it needs to be said that there are those that are taken and if you don't have to make a pay rent payment for five or six months and if this goes through January, it, it's the, the ripple effect is, is not good. And, and that's probably a small amount, but there is some out there that are definitely taking advantage of this opportunity and not making their rent payments at all. And we're still having to continue to provide services. Right. Yeah. Keep that property up to code Absolutely. and all of that. So that is a really great segue, Michael. Um, this question is for all of you. Um, what is, what do you, in your, from your perspective, how can we foster productive conversations between housing providers, residents, um, all of that, because that's key. We, you know, uh, the, the portion of the population who is, you know, unfortunately taking advantage of the situation is, is probably not having productive conversations. And it might be from either side, to be completely frank. So in your view, what's the best way to foster those conversations and to encourage, like, be in constant communication, like we've said so often? Um, Mandy? Well, I, I was just, and this is stating the obvious, but uh, clear and consistent communication is paramount. And again, the message is rent is still due. This is not, it doesn't absolve anyone of the responsibility, the contractual responsibility to pay their rent. And if in fact you are not paying your rent, 
you are kicking the can down the road. The rent will accumulate and be due whether it's October or January. Um, and it's not going to be any easier then. So we really at the city, we want to be a resource. We have the funding. We have the program in place. We can serve uh, low income people up to 80% median family income. You don't need to be a U.S. citizen to access our funding. We have tried to make it as low barrier as possible, um, and we welcome your applications. Um, but I, I, I think the communication that rent is due, with this is, it is due, um, and we want to help you. We want to help you be able to pay the rent. Hafez or, My or Vets or Michael, have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think I just want to say, you know, what Michael and Mandy are saying is correct, right? Like, I think letting tenants understand that rent is due. And if you're not communicating at all, you're actually almost certainly going to get evicted at some point, right? Versus if you're having that conversation, if you're trying to work it with your landlord, that might mean that not, you're just not going to get evicted at all. They might you know, work with you to pay back rent or work with you to be flexible or get rental assistance. But if you just stop paying and stop communicating, well, the day your lease runs out or something else happens, right? Or the eviction moratorium is gone, that's it, right? Like you're not going to be continuing renting in that place. And that will actually impact your future housing access as well as a renter. So I think really explaining that to folks is important right now. I do want to say, you know, we saw something in Rent 1.0 um, when we had their earlier rent um, program in the city of Austin, there were some landlords who were not accepting third party payments. So it wasn't simply something like not getting the city's payment, but also if, if a church is willing to pay or if a nonprofit is willing to pay, they were not accepting third party payments. And I, I would just encourage folks who really, and I know that there can be some like hoops to jump to in, in Rent 2.0. I know I've had this conversation with Mandy. We've tried to make this as simple as possible. So folks don't feel like, oh, this is too much for me to manage. But really, how do we have landlords easily be able to access these third-party payments? Because they, again, they help both tenants and they help landlords who have obligations that they need to be doing. And can I piggyback on that? Because Aves and I did have multiple conversations about Rent 1.0. And an, an important distinction was that um, we did not pay the full contract rent. We required in the first iteration tenants to pay 30% of their adjusted gross income toward rent. And then we paid the difference between that and essentially a, a HUD determined fair market rent. It was complex. I'm not going to lie. We had to figure it out. It relied on the tenant kicking in some money and us kicking in some money and the landlord effectively in most situations taking a little bit of a haircut. Uh, we got rid of that. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, it was administratively complicated. Um, and even though we only had a handful of landlords who said no thanks, uh, we did have some. And if nothing else, that was very unfair to the tenants who had jumped through all these hoops to get the assistance. And we wanted to give the assistance, but we couldn't give the landlord sign off. We have made it as simple as possible this go round. We will pay the full contract rent amount, even if it's above the HUD fair market rent. Full contract rent amount. You just need to uh, qualify. Great. So, Michael, do you have anything to add on how to create productive conversations? No, I think they've covered it very well. But as I said, it's about communicating because we're not going to go away. Mm -hmm. And if, if an eviction's filed, it really will make things more complicated for you later as this tight market uh, and qualification criteria. And then these are have credit implications. I mean, it just it goes on. So one of the first things we did right out of the shoot was Payments. We allowed those that are struggling, we put them on payment plans and they all did the right thing and came through and paid the rent, right? We're not waiving the contract. The contract's still there. So we have to have obligations and, and owners do need to be flexible. And it's discouraging, Mandy, to hear that owners are being ridiculous. Um, it's, we should focus on providing that housing. Uh, and so it's just keeping the communication open because there will be that day. And, and we're also very conscious of what the courts are going to have to deal with mm -hmm. as we get down there. And those floodgates kick open and how that will look, right? Even though if it's on January 1st, it's still going to be 30. How much time? 60 days. It's going to add to that process and it's just going to get more and more complicated. So it's, it, we all need to keep working together to help folks out on this.
Definitely. Um, I love that we've been able to have this conversation um, with experts from across the spectrum. Um, we, um, Megan Booth from NAR is here with us and we'll be presenting in um, just a minute, but um, those on our panel, Michael, Mandy, FS, any closing things that you want to mention to the group here? Uh, all I want to say is thank you for having us. I love uh, these conversations, particularly uh, when we bring diverse groups together with different perspectives. I think it's important. It gets to the heart of what we're talking about, which is communication between landlords and tenants and the city and stakeholders. And, um, you know, we need that feedback. We need to improve our, constantly improve our programs. And we want to get the word out about the resources that we have. So thank you for hosting this. Awesome. Aves, Michael? I just want to say uh, thank you to everybody for this great conversation. I think the last thing I just want to say is, you know, this is for landlords as well. We need to advocate Congress and our city council to expand rental assistance, to continue unemployment assistance. This is important for both tenants and for landlords. And we will be needing this assistance, whether it's in a month or in two months or in five we're seeing a very long horizon here for this pandemic. And I think we just need to make sure that folks get the assistance they need. So, and again, right, like if assistance goes to tenants and it goes to landlords, I think that's what we need to be advocating for. So I would definitely push and urge everyone to be advocating for that. Awesome. You um, set Megan up really well, but let's hear from Michael first. <laughs> Thanks. I, I agree with my colleagues here. It's been great to, to do this. I think we should have more conversations about this. You know, more than 50% of the population are renters in, in Austin. Uh, and, and we need to be conscious of that. And, and so there needs to be a lot more conversations about how to help those folks out that need to be helped. Uh, I know a lot of my realtor colleagues are here. Uh, anytime I, I do just leasing and property management. So if I can be of any help to you guys with resources or brainstorming, I'm happy to do that. I'll post an email address. Mandy and, and the last same for you guys as well. Also, I'd be remiss to point out that uh, the Austin Board of Realtors is having elections fairly soon. I am a candidate. And if you'd like leasing and property management representation on the board, sorry guys, couldn't resist the plug. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm your candidate. Thanks. Any good candidate has to take any opportunity to mention that they're running for something. So um, we're going to switch gears slightly um, to um, listen to Megan Booth from NAR. Um, Megan is the Director of Federal Housing and Commercial Policy at NAR, where she's worked for more than 20 years. So she covers topics of federal housing programs, such as FHA mortgage in insurance, VA loans, and rural housing programs, as well as multifamily and property management issues. Um, prior to NAR, um, Megan worked for BoatViz Construction Management, the American Maritime Officers, and on Capitol Hill as a legislative aide. She is from Nash Massachusetts and currently lives in Arlington, Virginia, with her husband and three children, I'm sure with... Um, all the virtual school, you've got your hands full. So Megan, um, give us the scoop. I think John is gonna set your um, slides up to share, so. And thank you to everybody else on this. I think it's been a, um, a great discussion so far. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the eviction moratorium. And I apologize, I did not update this um, date. I updated the rest of the slides. I didn't update the date on this slide. So. As you all know, uh, the CDC issued an eviction moratorium effective September 1st that runs through December 31st. Next slide, please. This applies to all rental units except those that are um, more protective than the CDC notice. And it does not apply to American Samoa because American Samoa apparently has a very low COVID rate, so they get exempt from it. Um, virtually all renters can apply for this eviction moratorium and they have to sign um, a declaration form. Next slide. The declaration basically says four main things that you make less than $99,000. And the reason why they use this threshold, it's the same as people who are able to get the stimulus check, that, that check from the IRS. That's the number they use. Unfortunately, that number means it covers 95.7% of all renters nationwide. Most um, of the previous eviction moratoriums applied to people making less than a certain AMI, area median income, or certain programs, but this applies to anyone making up to $99,000. They have to certify that they have used their best efforts to obtain rental assistance or housing assistance. 
and you heard about some of the options for renters to do that. They are unable to pay their rent or their full rent because of a loss of income, wages, or hours, or they have extraordinary medical bills. Note that this do not, these do not have to be COVID related, so they could have just lost their job for non-COVID related reasons. And lastly, if evicted, they would move into a homeless shelter or more crowded housing, i.e. What the, what the administration calls it is doubling up. If they move in with family or something like that, that's considered more, more crowded housing. So what can a landlord do? Next slide, please. So a landlord can, unlike a lot of other eviction moratoriums that have been out there, can charge late fees, penalties, and interest per the terms of the lease. So if your lease says if you don't pay your rent on time, you have to pay these fees and interest, then you can charge those fees and interest. You can also, and I will get into the complications with this, but according to the CDC order, you can also evict for non-payment of rent. And um, this is for um, health and safety reasons, criminal activity, theoretically for other terms that are violations of the lease. Um, but I'll get to in a minute how this has not been clearly um, interpreted across the country. Next slide, please. Why do realtors care? So 25% of realtors own manage their own rental properties. So while this isn't their, necessarily their primary business, they have some rental properties on the side. And in fact, NAR encourages realtors to invest in real estate since they don't have traditional 401ks. This is a good way to plan for your retirement planning, and unless now you're subject to this eviction moratorium and are getting that rental income. 46% of all rental units across the United States are owned by mom and pops, and another 37 are LLCs. So these are not big corporations. We're talking about a very small percentage that are owned by the big guys, the big companies who probably can absorb some of these losses. Most of the housing stock in the country is owned by small property owners. The impact on the housing market long-term could be devastating. We're very concerned that this could turn a healthcare crisis into a housing crisis come January of 2021. Imagine how many people will be filing for eviction as of January 2021. And if you have six months of back pay, back rent due plus penalties and interest, there's no way that most of these renters will ever be able to make those payments. Next slide, please. There are significant criminal penalties attached to this CDC order. Individuals and organizations can be fined up to $250,000. And moreover, if the person that you evict ends up catching COVID and dying, you're basically held liable for their death. You're not charged with murder, but you can have up to one year in jail and up to a fine of $500,000. So this is very significant penalties. This, and this is supposed to be adjudicated at the state and local law official level, but the Department of Justice can also um, get involved. Yes, this is very terrifying. <laughs> Next slide. So what is the solution? As um, Avas said, rental assistance. Rental assistance is the solution. So um, your state was talking or your city was talking about how they were using some of the CARES Act money and HUD just allocated some of the CBG money. That's great. And for people who are eligible to get that, that's great. Again, those apply to a limited number of renters and not the vast scope of renters that are covered by the CDC notice. So with legislation passed by the House that I will point out was a democratic messaging bill, never intended to become law, did pass the House that provided $100 billion in rental assistance, which would be excellent. Again, it only applied to people making 80% of area median income. But again, that would be a nice big pot of money that would make this more feasible. Also, the language in the HEROES Act made sure that that money went directly to landlords. Again, renters would have to apply, sounds similar to the program you have here in Austin. Renters would have to be the ones to apply, but the money goes to the landlord. Um, last slide, please. So what else are we doing? We have been working with our coalition partners. This right here is a lovely ad that we put into Politico, which is an inside the Beltway publication aimed at lawmakers uh, in, in DC with uh, our friends at the Apartment Association, the home builders, the mortgage bankers, IRIM and CCIM, all of the big um, multifamily organizations around town signed on to this letter. We are all urging Congress and the administration to pass some sort of rental assistance program because without it, this housing is all in jeopardy. So um, that's it for my slides, but I'm gonna finish up with telling you about, and then I'm gonna take um, questions because I know there's a lot of questions. Um, we, uh, yesterday, uh, NAR President Vince Malta, along with about 
12 realtors from across the country who are leaders of different um, NAR governance committees related to rental housing met with administrators at the White House to talk about this issue. Um, they had our realtors told great stories of mom and pops who are um, struggling um, to make this to make this work to not have their rental income and still maintain the property and still pay their taxes and pay their insurance had a great story from a realtor from California who manages properties for um, for a minority community with largely retired people who don't have mortgages on these properties but the insurance and taxes are still very high and these are people on a fixed income who who rely on this rental income for their survival, for their groceries, for their medical expenses, um, for their heating and cooling. So um, we had some great stories. We also talked about um, that, that without providing rental assistance, the backlog of, of overdue rent is going to be outrageous come January. So um, the good news was the administration actually seemed supportive of looking into reprogramming money that was already out there. Of course, nobody wants to spend more money on this program. We actually had a lovely conversation where they were like, oh, well, landlords could get PPP loans or EIDL or apply for unemployment. And we had to explain to them that no, passive income such as rental income didn't qualify you for any of those programs. So in fact, there's been no relief for landlords whatsoever since, the, since COVID started. And um, it's not just this CDC eviction moratorium, it's the previous federal eviction moratorium, it's all the state and local eviction moratoriums. Uh, rental housing units are suffering and rental housing units are in huge demand everywhere in this nation. And so putting these properties in jeopardy by delaying maintenance, by putting, putting owners in foreclosure, at risk of foreclosure, is really not good for all of our economy and for renters across the country. So. That was a great meeting. We are looking into ways we can reprogram some existing money and certainly there is some existing money out there. There were a couple programs that were funded under the CARES Act that never actually got off the ground. Um, there's a Main Street lending program within the Department of Treasury. There's some leftover funds and other programs that weren't used. So we are now working on ways to advocate with Congress on ways we can reallocate that money and get it immediately into the hands of, of housing providers so that renters um, won't be left with this deluge of payments come January and that these properties can be preserved. So those are all, that's all my um, spiel. I'm happy to um, take questions from any of you. One thing I am gonna point out, I mentioned briefly is the way this has been interpreted across the country has been hugely different by different courts. And I heard somebody ask a question earlier about like or put in the chat that they couldn't evict for any reason. We're absolutely hearing that. Courts are worried about those penalties too and judges are worried about it. So they don't wanna let you evict anybody that they're afraid could um, later catch COVID. So um, it's, a huge, it's a huge problem and we absolutely hear that. That um, is, that I will tell you those penalties sounded terrifying um, to be <laughs> held responsible for someone's death um, is like my worst nightmare. <laughs> and I'm sure everyone else's as well. We're so glad to hear that. I know that NAR is working really, really hard to um, on this super fast moving um, situation to do what is possible with a divided Congress. It is so difficult to get um, substantive things done. Um, the CARES Act, I feel like, was the last one yeah. that happened. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yep. So um, what do you think, um, just one quick question, I think we'll pass it over to our president to close this out, um, but what what do you think is the likelihood of a real solution happening? So um, you're totally right. Congress is kind of um, dropped the ball on this and they have not been able to come to any agreement since really the CARES Act, right? So um, they are still in session right now. They have to fund the government for 2020. The federal government's fiscal year runs out in 14 days. So they have to do that. And we're hoping that with that, they include some of these provisions in there. there you also heard people talking earlier about unemployment. We support um, extending the, the pandemic unemployment assistance. So, um, but honestly, I, I don't give it more than a, 30% chance of passing Congress. But this idea of reprogramming the money, the president has significant authority when it comes to reprogramming money. You're from Texas, you might be aware that he used some DOD money to pay for the wall. He can reprogram money that's out there. So um, we're, that's why we're trying to look at some of these programs and that may be something we would prefer to have Congress do that in conjunction with the White House. 
but it may be something the White House could do on their own. They certainly did this CDC notice on their own. Members of the House and Senate were flabbergasted, had no idea the CDC order was coming out. Yeah, it seemed like a really big surprise to And everyone. they did it Friday at like 4.05. Yes, I, uh, when I, I, I saw the NAR posting like five minutes later, that was um, really helpful, but still kind of like very Great jarring. Day. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Megan. Um, if we get any specific questions for you, we will pass them along and get some answers. I did see what happens when a tenant's lease term ends. Do you know that's a really good question? It depends on your state and local law, but a lot of states and locals allow that to be a holdover tenant. So if their lease is open and it is ending, and they and they are allowed to under the, your local ordinances to go month to month, then you're stuck. Wow. Sorry. Thank you for um, all of your hard work, and um, we um, look forward to continuing to update, keep getting updates from NAR. Is there, um, is nar.realtor slash coronavirus still the place to go to get info? Yes, absolutely. Go to that, and if you look under the political advocacy tab, we have an FAQ for housing providers. We have an update of the CDC notice. Um, I think today we have a press release on the White House meeting yesterday. We have links to the letters we've done to Congress and the administration. So, yep, nar.realtor slash coronavirus, and then click on the political advocacy tab. Perfect. Thank you for putting that in there. Great. Thank you so much, um, Megan, for joining us and all of our panelists. Um, Romea Monsonia, our um, local president here, will close us out. Thanks, Jenny. Yeah, I want to thank all our panelists, Aves, Mandy, and Michael for joining us today, as well as Megan Booth from NAR. And I'm really digging your relax sign behind you there, Megan. <laughs> it's very timely. And it's, uh, and Hashtag all this 2020. I know, right? <laughs> but again, I want to thank you for all this great information. Obviously, this is uh, an issue that, that there's no um, fix for right now. It sounds like we can't get on the same page with things. But I'm glad that NAR is advocating for not just realtors, but for our, our clients as well. So I also want to remind everybody that we're continuing our Realtor Safety Month initiatives throughout September. We're wrapping up the month with two member input sessions. The first one's going to be on September 29th from 2 to 3 p.m. And the second is going to be on October 2nd from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Be on the lookout on how to sign up and help provide feedback that will be used as we plan our safety programming for and initiatives into 2021 and beyond. I also want to remind everybody that uh, next week is our annual meeting. So Obviously, uh, we'd love to get together in person, but because of COVID, yeah, everything is virtual. So we're going to have that special virtual ABOR annual meeting uh, on September 23rd from 10.30 a.m. to noon. So following our 2020 ABOR annual meeting, Sarah Thomas will be giving a keynote about her incredible journey on becoming the first female National Football League official. I know ever since I saw that, now whenever I watch a football game, I'm like looking out, see, like see her on the, on the game, during the game. But again, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, hopefully you find all this information uh, timely and valuable. Uh, on that note, uh, please take a moment to exit, to take the exit survey on the way out and everybody have a great day and stay safe.